Hey, what's going on, guys? This is the Geeks of the Week podcast with Straw Hat and Jay Stoops. Say hey, Stoopsy. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back, guys. Thank you so much for supporting us in these last, not episode, in episode one. Uh, they, they were really great. They hit like gangbusters. Uh, we've oh gotten, God. man, like we've gotten the what? Reception. Maybe, like, ugh, reviews. We're, we're- yeah, we, we've gotten like over 300 reviews. Um, we're coming up on 30,000 uh, streams so far between our episode zero and episode one. It's wild. It's, you guys are amazing. Yeah, so thank you so much, guys, for supporting us. Thank you for everyone who downloaded. And this time, we got a little bit of structure because we know the last episode was <laughs> a two-hour extravaganza. That was just kind of us going off. But now we, we have friends to... Away. Yeah, but that's why they love us. That's why I love exactly. us. Exactly. Yeah, so. it's a good, it's a good vibe. <laughs> But now we got guests to do that with. So that's going to be what, four hours? We have a four hour show coming up now. Yeah, that's, I think we've clocked it four and a half. Double that time. I'm, <laughs> I'm down. I'm down with it. But we want you guys to meet our guests. We have, as you know, I'm on TikTok. His name is Theories by T. He is one of the just premier Marvel theorists. He, I don't know how he thinks of most of this shit. Like sometimes I think he's lying, but uh, <laughs> then you look up the facts and you go, oh, wow, he actually wasn't. Uh, so his, his name is Tyrell. Say what's up, Tyrell. What's up, guys? How's it going? Uh, thanks for having me. Really nice to finally get on with you guys it's after all the mentions in my app. It's been <laughs> so long. I feel like I know you, and like I can't believe this is the first time we're talking. So excited. Yeah, man. Pleasure to meet both of you. All right, next up, we have, I call her the first lady of TikTok. Charlie DeMello has <laughs> nothing on her because oh, she I'm hasn't hungry. even reached my FYP as much as Nikki has. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have probably seen her skits on TikTok. She is a celebrated veteran. She is a Marvel geek S. She does it all. She does the skits. She makes you laugh. It's Nikki Marina. Hey. <laughs> Man, so, so flattered. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. I feel like we need to put a drum roll effect in both of those. Uh, we'll do that in post. We'll fix it in post. Yeah. yeah. Or I'll just, you will just like edit a clip of me just like with drumsticks. <laughs> See, that's better. Let's do that. You know, I can just do it with my mouth. <laughs> but yeah, but we have a, we have a great episode too for you. We are, con- we are continuing our trend of our Marvel versus DC uh, mm-hmm. debate, but we're going to go strictly into Marvel on this episode because Falcon of the Winter Soldier is going so ham right now. Episode five just released. It dropped a lot of jaws. It made a lot of tears fall to the floor with Isaiah Bradley and just everything that happened. And the finale is coming up later this week. So we're going to dive full on into Falcon and the Winter Soldier for this episode. So get excited because we might cry. We might laugh. We might even start hating each other by the end of this episode. We don't know. Um, but I'm ready <laughs> Tensions for it. will be anyway. high. It's, gonna, it's, it's, it's a very tense show. It is. Guys, guys, my my blood pressure is so hot right now because every day, every day with this damn show. First, first we got grief, and when you deal with like themes of grief, like in Wandavision, it's you think, oh, there's there's no other feelings I could feel that would like put me through the ringer. And then Falcon and the Winter Soldier shows up and says, "Hold my beer, bitch. I got some shit for you." And I I feel like such an idiot because here I was thinking after like the tidal wave of emotion that WandaVision was, I was like, yeah, this will be cathartic. Like Falcon and the Winter Soldier has to be like buddy comedy. We'll get, you know, Bucky and Sam. It's going to be so fun. No, no. I mean, in a good way. But yeah, it's it's wrecked me. Because on paper, you look at it and you say, oh, you know, it's a guy with a metal arm and a dude with some wings that flies. He doesn't even have super strength or anything. (laughs) It's going to be great. We're going to get some guys who punch things really hard. There's a ginger. There, so there's yeah. the ginger representation that people have been asking for. Uh, Cap is old, you know. What's what else? What's happening? And then the first couple episodes, the first episode, you're just kind of like, oh, oh, you you guys are doing that. <laughs> this is this is what we're gonna talk yeah, about. Yeah, they've they really weren't messing around. But uh, so I, I wanted to start off by asking um, uh, Tyrell, um, you. So I know that we started off. Falcon and Winter Soldier on a bit of a a bit of a downward tick on TikTok um, because the reception of theorizing about WandaVision was a bit of a, a bit of a yikes for the fandom. And were you scared going in to like just go at him and be like, look, I know my shit. I'm not. I, this is just for fun. Like, but yeah, I, I t- tell me tell me your experience with that. I mean, like from WandaVision, I feel like WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier on paper were like just different shows that were going to get different responses anyway. One Division 
in and of itself was like very much a mystery. It was a, like no one knew what was going on. The MCU has not done anything near this. We barely know Wanda. So it was like, if we don't theorize, we're not going to know what's going on here. We right. need to get <laughs> That's the fun. That's the fun. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas like Falcon and the Winter Soldier, you know, it, like going in, you know, it's going to carry the energy of like the Captain America movies and stuff. You know, these characters are like, not that much, but a little better than you do like Wanda and Vision and whatever the rest of the characters were. So it was like, it, it felt like Falcon and the Winter Soldier wasn't going to allow a lot of theorizing really. I feel, I feel like, in I still kind of feel like that. There's a few mysteries along the way, but like predicting things like the show might explore racism, more... <laughs> logical deduction then <laughs> right right yeah and we've gotten a couple of easter eggs i wasn't expecting mad reporter to be brought up at all not at all not at all i was like okay you know what's funny about that is all throughout wandavision it's because wanda herself is an integral part of the x-men universe so naturally mm -hmm. people were going this is an x-men reference this is an x-men reference but then they don't deal <laughs> they, yeah. they throw us for a I loop with that with the uh I laughed my ass off when that bunny ate that fly because everybody <laughs> thought, because everybody was like, it's Mephisto, it's Mephisto. And when that bunny ate that fly, I shit my pants laughing. I was like, that'll teach you. <laughs> that was that'll an incredible teach you. moment. That was incredible. Yeah, Mephisto, <laughs> Mephisto over there eating flies, looking like a dumbass. <laughs> Mephisto's the answer to everything. Like. I mean, if anything, one division like uh, kind of put everyone's expectations a lot, like lowered the expectations, but it kind of chilled everyone out a bit. It was like, I mean, I think we can all agree the bunny being Mephisto and the mailman being a serial killer and stuff <laughs> like that. It was like, all right, none of that's not going any. There's no evidence for this. That's not going anywhere. There was now there we're was coming some to this wild show. theorizing. Oh yeah, I mean, but, oh, but yeah. you know what? You can't blame anyone because you, why would you show the mailman that amount of times with that with those crazy <laughs> looks? Well, I've Every always said that Marvel, he was like, hey. Marvel is so good at misdirection. Yeah. Like, they yeah. are so good at misdirection of, like, leading you one way and, like, you know, like, sensory overload. And then they'll bring something up that it's like, oh, my God, I should have thought of that before. But I was so busy focusing on that. But, no, that com completely makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. That like, means all one vision. Mm. It was just, like, misdirection. And I loved it. I, yeah. I, there he is. Yeah, yeah. I, th I, I loved WandaVision so much. And I'll say this for the mailman. I think that the theory that the mailman was Mephisto or evil ha has more, they, they had more allusions to that than like, for example, Thunderbolt Ross being the power broker. And I'm not yeah. saying that it's yeah. not possible, but whenever I, I just get so frustrated because I'm like, that would be the, you got to have a callback or something, you something. know, like yeah. you got to allude to it in some way. If you don't like, where, I hate it when people come out of nowhere, walking suspiciously in the background, like yeah. the mailman in in this show. You know, like come on. Yeah, One I mean, of the biggest questions I'm getting is like because we went Madripoor, like you said, like mm -hmm. okay, Madripoor, Wolverine, Patch, X Men, we're getting there. This is it. We're going all in. <laughs> it's like right now, I've been I've been Ralph Bonin before. I'm not doing this again. Uh, I, <laughs> if it does not make sense for the story, Wolverine's not coming up. I'm gonna sit back. And <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest difference between WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I think, is where WandaVision kind of, they did all of this to teach us a lesson. They put mm. this in and they were kind of like, well, we got, I don't, I can't remember who was supposed to come first. I think Falcon and the Winter Soldier was supposed to come first, but I believe I was. WandaVision was almost like the best natural first choice because it was so different, because it was such a misdirect where it taught you, hey, it's fun to theorize. Don't get too crazy. Don't like <laughs> we got engineers and stuff, but don't get too crazy. Like just calm down. And so like, now, now after WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier comes, and there's like little Easter eggs here and there. There's naturally within the show, there are things that kind of point you towards the what we're gonna have is the finale this week, but none of which is gonna make you go, Oh yeah, X-Men, like Wolverine's gonna yeah. show up and he's gonna help in the last fight with Falcon and he's gonna chop off the head of John Walker. Like, we're not thinking anything like, although we want yeah. that to happen. If only. But if, if only. <laughs> but I feel... Well, and I think, that, I think that this show has done a really good job of balancing fan service, but it's also like from episode one, it started hitting really hard with the mm -hmm. themes and everything. And like, Nikki, I can only imagine what it must have been like for you going into this and being a veteran, like immediately. Oh my gosh. Well, so it's funny because people ask like, what what's hitting bit like harder for you WandaVision or Falcon Winter Soldier and the thing is I also had a traumatic childhood and so I identified very closely with Wanda like way more yeah. than I thought 
And then right. Falcon and the Winter Soldier, obviously going into racism, but also like the treatment of veterans in this country, of which I am both. And so every single episode is has something extremely personal to me. And it's like, and it's eerie, but it's also, but it also shows that they've done the work. Yeah. And that's a really good thing, but it really does hit very hard for me every single mm. one. Can I, can I pick your brain on this just a little bit? Uh, yeah. Just with the idea of, cause that's, that's a very interesting overlap of not only being a person of color, a black person of color, but also being a veteran and how, uh, also being a Marvel fan, there's three sides of you that this show kind of is like almost tailor made for you specifically. Right. So like going back and watching Avengers Endgame, Infinity War, Avengers Endgame and seeing the blip happen, seeing people disappear into dust and then seeing them come back. We don't necessarily think of the repercussions of that. Right. We just go, people are back. Yeah. Everything's back to normal. <laughs> mm-hmm. But then you watch something like Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and to a lesser extent, Spider-Man Far From Home, where you start to really see that people are displaced, you know, people, the and then the people who fought to save the world, what happens to them after as well? What about those people who literally died in the w- biggest of wars? There, this wasn't a war of nations, this was a war for the universe. Yeah. And to see these people not only come back from being dead for five years, but also kind of get shafted, even though they pretty much given the biggest service, not only to their country, but to the world. Like, can you speak to that a little bit? Like, how is that feeling that they're overlapping? And what was that like for you watching that? Yeah, it's very interesting. Like, one of the things I've always appreciated about Marvel is that they have found a way, they've they've always found ways to tie in, like, this fantasy world into very applicable problems of today. And so I thought... I'm glad that they're addressing, you know, the socioeconomic political consequences of the blip, you know, like 20 million people come back out of nowhere. Like there is no, there's no lack of consequences there. It's a good thing. Yeah. But there's a domino effect. And then, but also, um, and I think that some people may have been, you know, surprised to hear this, but especially with like, um, you know, when Sam went to get a loan for his sister at the bank and everything, oh and they're like, you don't have any income for the last five years. I'm like, yeah, I've been fucking dead for the <laughs> past That pissed me years. off so bad. But yeah. Also, but like, but when you, but also like when you leave the military and you come into this world that it might, like I said, it might as well be a different planet to you mm-hmm. because you have presumably spent your entire adult life in this very, very small cult of military. Right. And like, and you and you enter in a world where you might as well have been blipped for that time that you were in uniform because yeah. nothing familiar to you. And you are, and you do feel displaced because, you know, cause like, you know, you have to find a job. You've always had a job. You have to find a job. You have to learn how to talk to people. You have to learn how to do things that like, you know, I, I to this day don't know how to fill out a time card because we don't have those in the military. They yeah. own 24 seven. I'm like, I don't know how to do that. Wow. So, and, and so like, there's like a lot of very interesting parallels to like, just to just that experience. Um, and also I'm a political science scientist. So I'm like, this is like, this is like Taylor, Taylor made it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Honestly, chef's kiss to me. So Nikki, when like we were introduced to Sam, he's uh, counts, he's leading a counseling group for veterans. Yeah. Uh, when you were introduced to that character, did you have hopes or expectations that they could ever like dive this deep into like the the reality of the veteran experience? I never thought that they would go this far, because we knew Sam was a counselor from mm-hmm. the second Captain America yeah. uh, movie. I never thought that they would dive this far. Um, Actually, after the first episode, I was like, who wrote this? <laughs> I, <laughs> honestly, I was like, who wrote this? And it was, it's Malcolm Stillwell. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Oh, Malcolm Stillwell. Spell, 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 sorry. Malcolm okay. Spellman, um, who headed up like Empire and, you know, and a whole bunch of other black led, you know, creations. And so I'm like, I see this makes sense. Um, it's not about race, though. But I mean, and honest, and I honestly, I think it's extremely, it's actually very extremely important to see Sam 
as a VA counselor because mm -hmm. um, mental health in the Black community is not a thing that is de destigmatized completely yet. And so I think it's a very big deal to see a Black man as a mental health specialist, right? Um, it, especially like in the VA where it's obviously very needed. Um, but I think that's a very, very big deal um, for yeah. Sam to have that background. Yeah. Um, yeah. I and I think times, but it is a very, very big deal. Yeah. And it's, and I think we're also underestimating how important it is to have a prominent black voice in the field of mental health to, to be that mental health specialist, not only in the field, but just in the black community, because yeah. As you know, like in the black community, we we do not talk about mental health as much as we should. Like, I know I didn't talk about mental health mm. in, in my family household when I was growing up, even though I desperately could have needed it. Um, <laughs> but, but having having literally a superhero yeah. be a mental health specialist first and you and having that be a, an essential part to how he operates as a hero. Like we saw how he tried, he even was counseling Captain America from the very first conversation that they've had. He was counseling yeah. Carly. He was count, he counsels Bucky in the, in the fifth, fifth episode, you know, the just way that he that asks Bucky, crazy. are you like, are you okay? After he's like putting on yeah. that older show was so mm -hmm. compassionate and like continuously checking in. Yeah. yeah. And I also, I also like to, I also like to call back in my mind to both the second Captain America movie and Endgame because I remember Steve walking in to the VA to meet up with Sam and Sam was leading a counseling, a PTSD counseling session. Mm -hmm. And then I fast forward in my mind to end game after like during those five years where they were like, fuck it, we lost. Um, and, and you see Steve is leading a PTSD He group. did it for Sam. He did it for Sam. And, and I love that because it shows how much admiration he had for Sam and like how much he learned from Sam and like how that was for him a, a way to keep him alive or a way to honor him. And so I think it's really cool to look back and see like even then what high regard Steve had for Sam. Yeah. And like, you know, just his thought process of like, oh no, this is the guy, right. like this next one. Yeah. Right. And T, I want to talk to you a little bit about this as well. Like specifically comics related because we know that falcon and the winter soldier has delved deep into the all new captain america run where sam becomes the new captain america and those stories specifically had to deal with the idea of a black man taking on that mantle of yeah. being captain america so like when we first found out in avengers endgame that steve was going to hand the shield over to sam a lot of people were thrown for a loop right and people were going oh well why why not bucky why not bucky they're best friends or they're lovers if you ask the right person <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but like linky just said the scene where steve is holding up a uh a support group and when you really think about it he he, he did do that because of his relationship with sam he is just as impacted by sam which makes the choice natural but even seeing that and even seeing the comics like, what do you think it is about Falcon and the Winter Soldier and its relation to the all new Captain America run that kind of uh, rattles some people? What do you think? What do you think is like the the important thing about that run that is so inspirational about the show? So, I mean, like, that's one of my favorite Falcon or Sam Wilson stories, like across all of his comic book appearances. He's had some good moments, but that's like mm -hmm. mid midway through the Captain America Sam Wilson run was one of, my, one of my favorites because they almost couldn't ignore the difference it would be to have a black Captain America than a white one. This like Cap Steve Rogers had political stories and those things would come up, but more so in relation to politics, politics against um, just within the war, you know, his first appearance was him punching Hitler in the face and stuff like that. Right. Whereas with a modern day black man as Captain America, it's like, right, well, will the world realistically re respond the same way to him as they did Steve Rogers? No, it was like, definitely not. And I think the people's issues in the comics was that when, in, in the complete like, contrast, when uh, Bucky becomes Captain America for, I, I want to say a slightly shorter run than, than, um, than when Sam was, it was more so Bucky kind of did it in honor of Steve. Like Bucky mm -hmm. took it upon himself to do it. Whereas in the reverse, when it was with Sam, Steve, Mm -hmm. gave it to Steve was alive and said you're the new Captain America I'm not doing this anymore you're the you're the right. one for this job and I think people's issue is more so that like 
I don't know if it's that they, they there are certain fans that bonded with Bucky as a character more and just thought, right, well, best friend must give it to this person. It's like the friendship I think is wasn't the wasn't the key element. It wasn't right. oh, he's better friends with Sam, so he had to give it to Sam. It's more mm-hmm. who was best for it. And in episode five, pretty much like hammered at home. It's like actually Bucky and Steve literally talked about it. Bucky has no regrets. He's like, I didn't even mm-hmm. want the thing. No, you were yeah. you were obviously the man. Like they all very maturely just agreed that like Sam was the perfect person, and I couldn't agree more. What's People, interesting about affirmative the... action? <laughs> <laughs> Superhero think, affirmative action. What's interesting about the changes that they made to Captain America and Bucky um, for the MCU was that like Bucky was a mentor to Sam uh, to Steve early on. Um, mm-hmm. Like Bucky, instead of being like his sidekick, like Bucky was the guy that Steve looked up to until he became Captain America, and then mm-hmm. like you even in the first Avenger like you see the transition where Steve like understands the responsibility that he has to take on and like even though he still has immense respect for Bucky he no longer sees Bucky as like this you know this figure mythic like he he looked up to him it seemed like a big brother kind of relationship in, Mm -hmm. in, in first Avenger um and then I think after Steve wakes up in the future even even if he'd even if Bucky had magically been able to show up without having gone through what he went through to become the winter soldier i think that uh steve really understood that sam was just a very special person like having to go through that experience of like um dr erskine choosing steve and saying it takes this kind like the serum needs a person that's like this level of pure of heart and not to say that bucky isn't worthy or isn't you know a good person but sam has always been just unbelievably pure of heart and right. I, I think that Steve recognized that in him which was really cool to see that like transition of Bucky is the first person that he looked up to but Sam was the person that even when he was Captain America he looked up to Sam like he mm-hmm. and that that's that's pretty impressive like to just to be to be everything that it means to be Captain America and look up to a, you know a simple veteran like Sam and say you're you're it kid like you you you've got what you've got it like right I also like to throw in the, um, like I said, being a veteran myself and being a PTSD veteran, um, which I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but we can, I think I can safely say Bucky got the PTSD. <laughs> got um, the PTSD. <laughs> and, you know, and like both men are obviously really important to Steve. Um, but I think also that Steve understood more so the, <laughs> the the long journey ahead of Bucky as far as recovery and when you have PTSD unfortunately I know firsthand like there you are not you're not the same person you were before there are so many things that you can't do Mm -hmm. you can't do anymore you don't have the headspace like you don't have the emotional or like mental like energy for it and and some and which is one of the reasons why I left the military because I'm like, I like for me, for more than one reason, I left the military, but one of them is like, I don't have anything left to give to you guys. You sucked it out. Mm -hmm. I need to, I need distance so I can heal. And, and I think that that's, I feel like that's where Bucky is at. I think they both knew that. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's also another reason why I'm sure they both mutually d- agreed, like, this is definitely Sam's deal. Because, right. yeah. you know, I love you, but but you're a fucking war crime. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's not lost on him. Yeah, Sometimes, like, you've you got know, work to do. Like, <laughs> like, like you've got like you've got the work to do. And that right. is like that's completely fine. It's, it's sad reality, but it's reality. And so yeah. I always think about that that um that element of it too yeah. just like bucky's mental health and and healing being way more important than him taking the shield right yeah. and you know what like there's also that little tiny wrinkle of that guy who just died that the entire world mourned bucky you murdered his parents in 4k like you, you got you choked out his mama and people know it. people know this so yeah, optics are new, not good not, but not a bad look dude so <laughs> but guys i think we've missed out on something huge and that is a trio buddy comedy sitcom with steve <laughs> bucky and sam 
Like I, I oh my god. These characters are so layered. They're so great. And I would I would fucking kill to get like a what if Bucky, Sam, <laughs> and Steve just after Endgame, they just all became best of buddies. They got an oh apartment together in New York. Yes. <laughs> just getting into hijinks. I would fucking kill to see something like that. Um, but that yeah, just goes that to show crazy. like how layered. Yeah, right? Like uh, oh. friends. Super friends. <laughs> they just need to make Falcon the real, fa- like a real Falcon, like he is in the comics, and have him be like their animal sidekick friend that lives and is always like. <laughs> that, I, need, I need, yeah. I need that. Like Iago, just oh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right, so uh, moving, moving into our next topic of discussion, let's talk. Let's just really quickly uh, talk about our favorite character, or what, who do you think is the most layered character in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier so far? I mean, obviously Zemo, he just pre- presumably left for the last time i think he'll be back but uh to me zemo has came out as one of the better characters in the mcu one of the most layered characters in the mcu he's almost filling that void of killmonger who's now gone and they kind of like almost have the same principles and the same kind of code but still pretty evil um so zemo is my pick for probably the surprise character my favorite character in falcon and the winter soldier uh megan wh- who's your favorite character so far it's it's really tough. Um, I I would say that I'm probably I, you know how bad I am at picking favorites, but like I, I think that that's why I put you up first. It, yeah, I think <laughs> Bucky is probably my like most improved character because I was mm. already I already loved Sam and Sam has really like this has really deepened my love for Sam and like seeing him especially the way he interacts with his sister and the way like his attachment to his family. Mm. Um, and again, just like emphasizing his compassion, like the way that he kind of hates Bucky a little bit, like they're like <laughs> frenemies, but he is always like, are you okay? Like, I care about your well-being before I care about anything else. Um, right. But Bucky, I felt like a lot of people like were huge Bucky stands, And I, you know, Sebastian Stan is a cool dude, but I was always mm-hmm. like, eh, he, he didn't really have a lot of development to me. Yeah. Um, and I've really come out of this so far, really um, having a, a strong fondness for Bucky. So I absolutely agree with you. I, I love um, everybody is my answer. I love it. <laughs> but but I, I think Bucky is probably my most improved. Yeah. And it's funny that you say that too, because Bucky, like you said, they kind of nerfed his character. He was super interesting when he first came back in The Winter yeah. Soldier. You know, was there was mystery. so much. It was so mysterious. It was mystery. There was depth. Yeah. There was pain. There was you saw a little and then you know you go to the flashbacks of hey man maybe you could shine my shoes you know hey yeah. you know you know I, i'm here for you till the end of the line just all that just created such a great character and even like his fight choreography the fight scenes and everything <laughs> but then he just became the guy the damaged white boy who could shoot things really good like with the yeah. further we got into the mc every time you saw i didn't even see him throw a punch he was just shooting things really really well yeah. But I, I totally agree with you. I think Bucky, when you, when it comes to most improved, I think they redeemed Bucky's character in this show. Uh, T, what do you think? Who's who's your surprise slash favorite character from the show? So, I mean, in the world of like surprise, I agree with, I'd say like Bucky, just because like for those reasons, like I think up until this point, I, I we got more of his personality in Captain America, the first Avenger than probably any other movie. Like yeah. Winter Soldier, he was like he was very mysterious and like interesting because you kind of knew what, what was gonna what was going on with him the, the more they revealed his story. But really, like who Bucky was was who he was in Captain America: The First Avenger, and we pretty much haven't seen that guy for like however long it's been since that movie, like the 10, 11 years since that movie. Mm-hmm. So to see like that that personality come back, I feel like he just hasn't had that. Like Civil War, I feel like as far as much as like, I did enjoy that movie, they kind of glossed over him. Uh, becoming himself again because mm-hmm. uh, they were like he's, he's brainwashed and then he wasn't brainwashed but then Zemo brainwashed him again and then Sam and Cap was able to unbrainwash him off screen <laughs> and it was like okay well this is Bucky now and from that point on it was like okay you you need me to shoot stuff I'm there just give me Bucky was just over shit in Civil War he was just over it <laughs> and like Infinity War I mean realistically I feel like his, his primary role in Infinity War was because we need as many heroes as we can in this film yeah. and well Bucky's yeah. been in Wakanda. Get him. Get out of here, you rascal. <laughs> Wake up. Join this. <laughs> Wake up. Yeah, Wake up, here. bro. Wake up. Hey, so, you be, I yeah. think even I, I think it literally at one point T'Challa says, the white wolf has been sleeping enough. He's, he's, he's been just, like, <laughs> long enough. He's, like, he's been yeah. sleeping long enough. Give him yeah, the arm. You're living here. You're living here rent free, bro. Come on, get in this. <laughs> I don't think he paid rent um, either. I don't think there's a down payment on the hut that he was living on in. On that little hut, no. So. <laughs> yeah. Fire. I mean, about, about saying that though, like, so I, I like just seeing he, that he has this personality and he's a lot more layered uh, than, he, than he has been. 
But also, and this is going to be a controversial one, I guess, uh, but take this with salt. John Walker, I really like how they've communicated. Hey. Like, I don't like I don't like him. I would say he's not, he's not my favorite character of the show. Let me cl- mm-hmm. clarify that. My favorite character of the show is definitely Sam Wilson. I call it implicit bias. I really like seeing the origin <laughs> story of the yes. hero. Simple, like, that's as plain and simple as it can be. Um, but with John Walker, I really like how much they want to show his descent into effectively Absolutely. madness yeah like yeah. and they always kind of they put this sort of like question that i don't think they're really answering was like was he a good man to begin with and are we just seeing him just unveiling who he truly was or is it that he was a good man oh interesting and just slowly making the worst decision it's like i like just kind of seeing where they're going but episode by episode i'm like oh you suck dude like you <laughs> well, suck we, so hard we love, like, we love to hate him and i think that's exactly really important that with part. the villain yeah, yeah. like you've you, you he is a great villain and he marvel it seems like they've learned their lesson i'm really hoping that mm-hmm. after ne- after the finale like it seems like especially with the introduction of the contessa that i'm really excited yeah. about yeah. um that it seems Love like it. he might be a long time player which is great because villains that get more time to you know ruminate in their decisions yeah. Mm-hmm. They, they're so much more interesting and he is very well characterized i might i might hate him but i love to hate him you're right <laughs> he's yeah. he's i love contrary to what i've been saying in my analysis of this show i i everything that i've been saying leads to him be being a great villain to being yeah. a great yeah. character because yeah. where we see him from i wouldn't say his first appearance is when like obviously we hated him because he was holding the shield and he gave us that fucking wink with the no teeth oh smile God. but <laughs> but the episode right after that where he's just in there practicing i'm captain america i'm captain america you know trying to not mess this up because he knows this is a big deal not and it's not for him it's just people need something to look up to and you got the sense that he just wants to do the right thing and it's it's interesting when you see him first practicing the i'm captain america it's very genuine it's very yes i'm I'm a good guy okay okay Mm, kind of a nerd kind of a geek and now he's kind of this I'm oh, Captain America and how dare you yeah. take away that and you're just like whoa where did this guy come from yeah. and you you follow that journey and you just you just love it I, I I've said that John Walker is what Agatha Harkness should have been be, yes. in WandaVision because Agatha Harkness is almost the same type of there she's interesting in idea because they've also left her in an interesting place where Wanda and most likely Doctor Strange is going to have to go back and mm-hmm. talk to her which yeah. puts her in almost a Zemo John Walker space that John is probably going to be in after the show. But John, you got who he was from the first get go. And you saw that descent. You saw him make bad decision after bad decision. Yeah. And there's still maybe a little bit of hope that maybe he can come back. I don't know. After he well, bedazzled his. The thing is, especially as someone, like I said, military, we've everyone who has ever worn the uniform has served with a John Walker. Mm. And mm. a lot, I, I did a whole YouTube rant about this because people were very, um, some people were really surprised when he went postal on the Flag Smasher. And the veteran, I'll tell you, the veteran community at large were like, we were, I mean, like the, the way it was done was very shocking. And of course, the imagery of the shield, the blood on it, it was just, uh. mm. but we we're like, man, we've all served with a John Walker. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. and not just one. Yeah. That's terrifying. John Walker's, it's, they're John yeah. Walker's walking around <laughs> everywhere in the military. This is not um this is not a made up archetype. Right. When I see John Walker, as much as I fucking hate him, yeah. I know these people. I know him. Well, right. and as much as as much as I still like it doesn't excuse it, but what he says at his trial is hundred percent accurate. Like you mm-hmm. made me. Yeah. That's and oh, not just posted a video about it. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, I love the wording he chose. He said like, "You yes. built me," rather than like, "You didn't, you didn't uh, train me. You didn't uh, foster me. You built me like a machine." And yeah, kind of. Yeah, that he says to come back in the end with the building this the shield thing, kind of like I. Right. Was like, well, well, let me tell says, you, I did what you told me to do, and I did it well. I only did what you instructed me to do, and I did it to the best of my ability. Which you could say is, you know, another kind of like metaphor for the systems that are already put in place that puts these quote unquote bad apples in. You could take the bad apple out, but there's always going to be another one that you could just put in and they're just going to keep building more. So John is just kind of saying like, hey, 
I just did what you guys wanted me to do. Like, what, well, what do you want from you, me? When we, when we go into boot camp, it, and anyone will tell you this, we go into boot camp and they tell us over and over again, we are going to break you down and build you back up into what we need you to be. They tell us right, that right. over and over and over again. And like, no matter how strong-willed you are or think you are, you're brainwashed. Mm-hmm. You, <laughs> that's you powerful. Have, yeah, that's you are. So when and you talk about like make... the most layered character, sorry, uh, it's like when you talk about sort of the most like layered character, that's when I, my thought goes to him because like not layered in the, then like, oh, wow, I want to know so much more about you. It's like, there's just so many more layers to your douchebaggery yeah. that just gets stacked on top of each other. It's like- yeah. Well, again, white privilege. Like literally, mm-hmm. he's just literally, he's been told his entire life, part of what molded him into what he was is constant uh, reaffirmation from people yeah. like Lamar, from people like the military who are like, you are making the right decisions. You Fucking are Lamar. never never question <laughs> yourself. You, you strong, strapping, white, blonde haired, blue eyed American boy. And it's just, that's, you know, and people, people have been so, upset uh about people who have commented and said that he is you know a symbol of white privilege because they they conflate that to people saying that he is racist and i don't think sorry i don't don't think that maybe he's racist i don't think we've seen enough from him to you know definitively say oh he's racist but he being a symbol of right white privilege doesn't you don't have to have malicious intent to do harm the and to be benefit. part of the system yeah mm-hmm. that's the things and that's the thing that i think a lot of people were another fact that people were very uncomfortable to face but it's true steve rogers benefited mm-hmm. from white privilege now Wasn't does racist that not a racist rogers? bone in his body not, not racist not racist at all is he still the steve rogers that we know love and respect and would love to be like mm-hmm. yes it has, yeah. it has nothing to do with who he has as a person. It has everything to do with how people saw him because Absolutely. He, Bradley did exactly the same thing. Mm-hmm. They both defied yep. orders, broke out to save their comrades. And Steve actually came back and was like, throw me in jail. <laughs> like, <laughs> Right, right. Steve literally came back in the first adventure. He was like, I did what I had to do. Sorry, but not sorry. Throw me in jail. I'm ready for the consequences. And they were like, Unnecessary. You know, no, that's fine. Yeah, Isaiah did not get the same luxury. Mm, they threw him yeah. in jail as soon as like, that dude came back. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like you can apply the same logic to a lot of heroes. And like the one that comes to mind like straight away in terms of like, wow, white privilege did you a solid is Tony Stark. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my god! Back yes. to oh. back yes. mistakes, and like, I like, what's so I like, like, with him, like, because of his personality, I'm more just like, ah, Tony, like, <laughs> make me laugh for the next film, and you're good to go. But then, like, realistically, it's like well, every single movie you have done like the worst possible things that any other person of color would get completely demolished yes. for. Oh my gosh! I just like, saw an amazing TikTok where this girl was talking about the fact that the Sokovia Accords were something that the world needed to do after a foreign national Wanda Maximoff accidentally tried to save people by diverting a suicide bomber uh, at the mm-hmm. last minute. And she, you know, she was not really in control of her powers. She'd previously been like a victim of human experimenting and, mm-hmm. you know, she's barely got a control of herself and she tries to save people by moving a suicide bomber away. That's what the Sokovia Accords are for. Not Tony Stark, a billionaire building an AI intentionally. <laughs> and <laughs> like, no, I mean, are you serious? is that like it's that's what we're i mean it's just it's nuts like that should have been the final straw not not wanda guys let's let's fuck can we like be real really quick no number one i just been holding on to the thought lamar wasn't a real best friend fuck that guy um rest in peace fuck that guy he wasn't an enabler he didn't keep it real enough he didn't keep it real enough he didn't say like bro he only oh you can't just punch your way out of it i'm like bitch if you fuck this that's what i would have been um yeah. but back but to Tony like Stark. Nikki said maybe that was because of like military you know him maybe. being yeah. in the military and, you know and here's the thing guys they, they there, there's a lot of continuity in continuities and it have to be when they portray military um but John is a captain Lamar if I'm not if I'm not mistaken as a master sergeant um mm-hmm. so John is an officer Lamar is an enlisted man uh in the real world there is quite a divide because those are two echelons of ranks. You're actually not even supposed to really allow it to be buddy, 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 like friends or it's wow. a fraternization. So actually, that is a very real dynamic because you don't, when you're Lamar's rank, like you, you can't just tell an officer what okay. to do. 
I'll give him you a pass. Can. <laughs> you, can't, okay. you can't just tell an officer what to do. Okay, um, okay. And so that was always that was always very interesting to me. Like obviously they've been through a lot together, several mm-hmm. tours and everything, but that but that dynamic still exists. Okay. And you have to be very political and careful with that dynamic. It's okay. something that's, that's cool. But yeah. Yeah. I can just I mean, imagine him going home to his wife, like, babe, you won't imagine what this fucker John Walker did I today. Bet. And I couldn't tell him. And I <laughs> couldn't tell him. <laughs> I told him just, hey man, you you got medals, like you do your thing. But uh, <laughs> uh Tony Stark, not only we he should have been reprimanded way before the even Ultron thing even happened. He sold yeah. weapons that got dealt under the table that murdered people. Well, that was Obadiah. It was Obadiah for sure, for mm-hmm. sure. But there still needs to be said something about a guy who was unaware of what was happening. You're you're a person who can create AI that can talk to aliens in space, and you couldn't figure out that your own man's was selling shit under the table. You know, he's capable of figuring that out, right? Tony Stark's privilege is so layered because he grew up a billionaire. His father built a company based on military contracts, building weapons of mass destruction. They were a military arms company, Stark Industries. Mm -hmm. And he grew up in a beautiful home paid for with the blood of, you know, millions of people. And regardless of how that technology is used, like when you become an arms dealer, a, uh, you know, war profiteer, you're, you're making a conscious choice. And, you know, you can always say, oh, well, if I don't do it, someone else will, but that's a, that's a pretty lazy excuse. And Tony, even when he, you know, became the, the CEO of Stark Industries, he's a genius. You know, Tony only confronted his, his own responsibility when he, it could no longer be avoidable when he literally was face to face with the weapons in his face and his own mortality in his face and i just Absolutely. think that you know you, people can grow sure give him credit for growth but i think it's really telling about his character that he can reach adulthood you know probably his 30s and he doesn't confront what he's really doing in the world even mm-hmm. passively even as a you know until until it really truly affects him and right. and and that that you know that's a shame that's very very powerful stuff very because (laughs) i'm always i'm always here for the tony stark slander and calling i'm I'm yeah i I love tony stark i am a tony stark stan so i'm just like (laughs) well different opinions are fine because like it's like yeah there's a whole bunch of things that you're not sympathetic to until i happen to you Mm -hmm. i thought depression and anxiety was a cop-out and fake until I got PTSD. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that, and that now is I'm like, oh, that's not yeah. fucking fake at all. And so now, and so now I dedicate so much of my time to be like, this is fucking real and stop mm-hmm. shaming people that have it in the same way that, like, you know, yeah. Tony was like, whatever about it until he got captured, went through all of that shit and was like, you know what, maybe we should not be contributing to, you know, all of this tor- turmoil around right. the world. You right. know, so it's like, and, however and you did. get there, however you get there. Yeah. Yeah. He, and he did make a, a, pardon my pun, a stark turnaround um, <laughs> <laughs> immediately. That was nice. Also, I mean, like, I Iron Man 3 is one of my very favorite MCU movies. I know that's Dang. controversial. Mm-hmm. I don't care. Yep. And if, in my opinion, if they had kept up the development that they had established for Tony in that movie, because I just feel like he regresses a few times when uh, different writers yeah. take on. Yeah. Um, but if they had kept like that Tony Stark in that movie, I love that fucking guy. That guy yeah. that uh, what what is it that the villain says? Uh, what is it? You're a cheap trick and a cheesy one liner. And he says that could be the name <laughs> of my autobiography. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Iron is Man Three is Tony definitely Stark. my favorite Tony for sure. Because he, yeah. I, I hate when people. So, here's the thing: I'm cool with Iron Man slander, and that's mostly born out of Civil War teams yeah. and shit. But you do not come for Iron Man 3 and say that that's Absolutely. not a good Iron Man movie. No. Do not no. say that no. shit. It's the best progression of yep. Tony as a character. How What he's dealing with after Avengers 1. Like, hey, I, you got, I, I'm on a team with... he. He's. I'm sorry, I'm coming to this realization right now. He's basically <laughs> the Hawkeye that we didn't get, but in a suit. Because he's, yeah. he, he's like, You're I'm right. fighting with a monster, a god, a fucking master assassin, a super soldier, mm-hmm. and I'm just literally a dude in a metal suit yeah. I'm just trying my best and, I'm, yep. and so he overcompensates by building suit after suit because i have to yeah. i have to protect the world i have to protect the world and that is 
the true like I think it's the like before I guess Captain America Winter Soldier it's almost the most grounded take on a superhero because he's dealing with I literally saw a portal open up and aliens came through and I almost died in a new Mm -hmm. and he's coming to terms with that so yeah Tony Stark Iron Man 3 is is amazing the most realistic depiction of PTSD I've ever seen Mm. I think the problem with Tony Stark came, like like kind of like you guys said, like where the writers and the directors changed throughout. Because effectively yeah. you went from like Jean Favreau back to Joss Whedon. And it was like, uh, Jean Favreau was trying to do one thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Joss Whedon was being oh, Joss Whedon. But Joss Whedon came and did his Joss like, Whedon thing. How you managed to end Iron Man 3 with him like having this cathartic moment of destroying one of his suits, and then I and then Age of Ultron's like, I'm gonna build a thousand of these things all yeah. over the world. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't care. Not nope. Yeah. Not interested. We've already kind of touched on this quite a bit. It's drenched in real world parallels, cultural impact. Uh, there's some things that you can take from the show and actually put a direct line into what's actually happening in this world today. So uh, I just kind of want us to kind of go around and talk about um, what is the most impactful thing about this show what is what is the most shocking thing that kind of like ties into what and what what's the interesting thing about that uh nikki let's start off with you where to start like and like i said every single every single episode has something that i'm like i've seen this happen like you know even like from the like the end of episode one where they straight up took the shield and gave it to john walker well, and it, it is very reminiscent of like you know in the military very few black men, black women, people of color make it to upper ranks because it's all about who you know and who likes you. And, you know, and so that's why it's very, very rarely do you see people that look like us in those upper echelons. And and because of the fact that they would rather see people that look like John as the face of America than us. Um, the, you know, the whole Isaiah Bradley thing going into Tus- the Tuskegee stuff and being tested on which by the way they do to us in mm. the military in real life oh well, that's and, good that you did yeah yeah it <laughs> happened um bucky's shitty therapist and bad how bad va therapists really really are um like seeing his moment in wakanda where he's having like his expo- exposure therapy moment which hit for me because like I go to those types of therapy too. And it really can be that emotionally jarring when you have a breakthrough. And so I was like, this is, I was like, somebody's reading my life. Honestly, it was like, it's ridiculous. Um, but I, and, and, and a detail that I, I really do appreciate is how they gave John Walker a black best friend and a black wife mm-hmm. because a lot of and 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 it's funny because a lot of people are falling into the trap with this character that they do with real people mm-hmm. who fuck up in the real world. They're like, "Well, you think it ain't no better? He has a black wife. <laughs> you think you know better? He has a black best friend." And like that does not discount you from being problematic. Yes, you know? yes, and absolutely. So all these little details that they put in is just like, huh. It's it's way it's way more real. This is it's it's way more real than people realize. I think. Yeah, y'all know. That's a real testament yeah. to what you were mentioning, um, Malcolm Spellman. That, that's mm-hmm. the yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that Marvel is is doing a, a much better job of diversifying um, their behind the scenes people, their writers and their creators. Because when you get, I mean, it's like when Disney made Mulan. You know, when you yeah. make a project that's meant to be performatively. Uh, performative activism and you say oh we're making a movie about Chinese people and you don't have a single Chinese person on your writing team or behind the scenes you know it's gonna it's gonna be problematic but I think it really the work that they've done to make sure that if this show is an authentic representation at least from my perspective which is obviously the (laughs) I defer to 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 all of your judgment um but it it seemed like they've they've really taken care in the way that they're depicting these things I think it's I'm glad you said that too Stu's because I just found out that Pootie Tang was written and directed by Louis C.K. which rocked me to my core it rocked me to my core Oh, are you serious? Dead fucking serious. I queued up my TikTok to make a review because I've never talked about Pootie Tang and I grew up on that movie. And if you, you if you're black, that's the hood movie right there. Yeah. You know, that's the hood yeah. comedy. 
And I was showing the title and I saw Louis C.K. written and directed. I'm like, this mother. So I started <laughs> rewatching the movie and I was like, this shit doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, hey, what the fuck? And that it fucked me so up. much into context. <laughs> oh my. So I would, I would implore you to please rewatch that movie and uh, just, just look at it through that lens. But it is very important that if you're going to talk about certain subjects that have to do with Black people or veterans or anything like that, it's important to have that represent- representation behind the camera so that way you can get the yeah. accurate and most true uh, piece of art from that. So that I'm I'm so glad that you said that. And as you guys know, I I picked up on the fact that this dude was surrounded by black, surrounded by black, black wife, black best friend. His introduction was to an HBCU band. Like Sam was the one who, without Sam, he never would have gotten the shield. The soup, the serum he ends up taking came from Isaiah. Yep. Everything about him is from the at the expense of the black people around him, and yeah. that's so true because then people can say oh, well, he has a Black best friend, so how could he have, like, his own prejudice or benefit from white privilege and things of that sort? So that, again, is that accurate depiction of people who are surrounded, who surround themselves with the culture is immune to being, um, having their biases and prejudices and things. Well, it seems like a commentary, too, on the way that America as a society um, favors, like, we're literally built on white supremacy and white privilege because, out of a sea of diversity, John Walker is plucked from all of the, you know, there's, there's, you know, black people all around him and he's the one lifted up, you know, I, 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 it's very, very reflective of the way that our society rewards, um, whiteness. Right. Right. All right, T, what do you think? Well, what's, what's on your mind, man? I mean, you guys hit all the nails on the head, but like the specific point, like that, like Nikki made towards the end is like how they've kind of, how well the main thing is how they have communicated covert racism throughout the show and made it so nuanced and like Stroha, I know you like and like all your comments will, will attest to this so uh, nuanced that people just can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> like you it's like too episode covert. one, episode one to two, I think was the like the period where I was like, okay, I kind of understand where people might not have noticed the mm-hmm. the subtle microaggressions when um when the the guy took the shield from Sam in, in, in the first scene. And uh, he did the, the right maybe thing. In my right best, thing to he do. did the right thing. The, I mean, Rody side I said it all in that moment. Yeah. I was just like, yeah. <laughs> my favorite <laughs> thing was watching Rody be like, "Yeah, yeah Rody. Rody. No. <laughs> He looked at him and said, "They fucked on. you. They <laughs> fucked you, Sam." <laughs> I mean, you have to realize that an intentional choice to choose one of the only black other Black Avengers to come to like see to come and talk to Sam. Be like. Dude, right. they're screwing you over. Um, we were like, let's talk. Let's talk this out. Let's take a walk because you need mm-hmm. this help. And then later, you know, the, the microaggressions in, in the bank scene. That yeah. again, like, because they're microaggressions, because it's covert racism. It's like mm-hmm. only that really certain people would have caught it before others. And like, we, we all made you know TikToks and everything. Like, yeah. covert racism, racism. We pointed out as soon as, and you know, as sure how you know probably more than most, a wave of audience are like, no, it's not. Yeah. You're wrong. No, and it's like, right, fine. It's covert. Maybe you missed it. Episode two comes. <laughs> the guy gets stalked by the police when we're just talk- barely breathing to 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 Bucky, just talking. And two policemen are all up. And I, I, you know, I, I'm aware. You know, Baltimore like has like is not known more than most for like, the issue of like police kind of robbing yeah. people. And stuff. Yeah. But like they, the fact that they inter- the writer said, right, we're gonna have a full on scene where policemen just go straight up and and harass Sam. It's like, how do you see that and not? What? I'm like, I'm like, yeah. And just last week, there was that video of that veteran being pulled over and pepper sprayed. And literally, yeah. I just, as soon as I saw that, I was like, and this literally, this literally happens all the time. <laughs> and you're going to tell me it's forced that Sam gets, mm-hmm. you know, profiled in the street. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I, and it I feel like I'm repeating me. myself. It happened to me when I, I, I was pulled over. The guy was very aggressive. But once he, but once he saw my insurance was at USAA, and he was like, oh, you're in the military. I'm like, yeah, I'm a lieutenant in the Air Force. And he was like, have a nice day. Like nothing, yeah. like just instantly disappeared. I'm like, yeah, I've had that moment, the same one that Sam had. Yeah, and I've had multiple moments like that. One when I was like 16, literally outside of my house. And he said that there's been robberies in the area. I'm like, yes, I know. I live right here. <laughs> like I, I it's full well. So, and literal multiple things. So the fact that it really happens and then people just kind of go, 
eh, I don't know, man. Yeah. Like even it, and even explaining it explicitly, like I've made so many videos just saying, you've seen the profiling scene, you've seen the bank scene, you've seen Sam literally saying, hey, you will not understand what it's like to be me. You've seen all of these things. You've seen Isaiah freaking Bradley. Yeah. And you're yeah. still, you're stretching, dude. You're, you're stretching. And, it, and they claim to be comic book fans. Interesting. Yeah. 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 You know, so it's, it's just very... Uh, when I was trying to explain the LSU, like, oh, have you, did you play for LSU? People don't understand that there is a true thing where if you're a black person and you're successful, people yeah. will assume you're either a rapper yeah. or a baller or a drug dealer. <laughs> so the fact that he, oh, you, did you play for LSU? A lot of people tried to, oh yeah, you know, it's probably because he grew up in that area. Maybe he looks like one of the athletes that goes to that college. I'm like, come on, dude. So I'm just pulling this out of my ass now. So it's just, it's like extremely frustrating to kind of see all of these comments blatantly ignore the yeah. step after step after step after step. And it literally takes an old black man crying, saying the words, they will never let a black man be Captain America for you to finally be like, oh, well, maybe. Yeah, they literally maybe. had to drop the word black from a different a million different motherfuckers mouths including james buchanan barnes just yep. straight up saying we never thought about what it would mean to hand the shield to a black man and i'm like okay well do y'all see it now Shit. yeah, yeah. And like, that's, well, and that's what, like how they've done it like obviously yeah they have like the very apparent zines where it's like it's because i am black like they're, they're yeah. very much in front of it, like fully on camera yeah but then where they, I, I just love and like uh straw you're saying it, especially with john walker especially how they've just it's just trickle little things that like you'd only know it if you've seen it before yes like, john's yes. like immediate reaction to getting his ass kicked by the dora was like oh come on love it come on <laughs> he's literally embarrassed that he got beat up by black ladies like that's the whole yep. thing there's nothing, hey there's nothing more to hey it. Hey, and people need to understand the layers of that too. Because remember, he tried to come at a black man. He antagonized a black yeah. man first. Yeah. And then we all know, we all know like the hierarchy. Like there's the black man is very disrespected in America. Black women are supremely disrespected in America. It's Absolutely. like black and black women. Holy shit. So the fact yeah. that he tried to come at a black man and then in his mind, the people on the low, the JV team <laughs> came in and, and they mopped the floor with him and they, they weren't even super soldiers. That's my favorite line. It like yeah. the MCs. <laughs> they weren't even super soldiers. Um, like, oh, yeah. poor dude. Yeah, poor cry dude. about yeah. it, John. They <laughs> cry about it. it was, like, it's, it's written It's written in such a, a, like, I mean, it's almost like a bittersweet thing because it's written so well and so accurately. And this is the benefit of having Martin Spellman uh, helm the script is that the audiences were genuinely like, yeah, but he's got a black best friend. Like <laughs> maybe the you know, the Dora were in the wrong instead of John. Like, what what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but but it's so well that the audience literally are reflective of what the world in the MCU is effectively like. Like right. they have completely uh shown who those exposed who those people actually are through those very small scenes of macro right. I think like the most underrated moment as well is the uh and people like I literally had a full week conversation about this is the scene where john uses a police siren to get the attention yes! of bucky and sam oh, that's people oh people did not understand when i said that was i didn't say he was racist i said he was tone deaf when he did that because Absolutely. as you know we black people like when we hear police sirens it's not just a oh it's the police it's the oh i might not come home tonight or today or whatever so the fact that somebody would use that to get sam's attention and it's if you watch my video, like my video kind of like lost connection when I was like recording it, but I kept it because Sam's face, his facial reaction to that happening to him said everything. Everything. And so explaining that to people, like, oh, everyone gets nervous when the police show up. It's like, no. for a black, that's no. a whole nother yeah. experience yeah. for a black. Let me, I mean, literally I, as a very small white woman, I have been outright rude and antagonistic to police on i have a bit of an issue with authority it's a problem i don't but, want to see this now <laughs> but i like i i had cops roll up to my wedding uh because we rented a private estate and uh they the neighbors that were literally like five miles away the music was too loud and i was like 
little bride i was like uh excuse me like <laughs> there we i know i i'm the one who booked this venue there's no sound ordinance in the area so have a nice night thank you for stopping by like i i don't i and i know that the only reason i can get away with that shit is because the way that i look and i mm. had already had i mean my my father's worked for the government my whole life so that probably stems from a, a lot of the, the core issues <laughs> um but <laughs> Really, it's just, it's, you know, um, it's not something that I realized that I could get away with until I was older. And like, as soon as it hit me, it, it just realizing that you're able to do something that could get someone else killed right. Right. is a very heavy thing to learn. And it's important to make that realization. And the cultural impact that this show has had on me as a, you know, as a white viewer, um, seeing Bucky make these realizations, seeing john walker's seeing that you know th that courthouse scene the, the whole thing not the courthouse the jailhouse scene drove me so insane because he rolled up to that place like he was a frat boy and his daddy was an important uh senator and it was like don't worry i i got you out ha ha let me just do the siren because that's it's a funny thing it's like this is a completely different situation for you than mm -hmm. it is for these people and yeah. the fact that you don't even care to try and empathize is very upsetting right. Who made the call? And he does that fucking douchey ass. It was me. <laughs> yeah, I did it. <laughs> like, oh, fucking oh, time. But, but <laughs> also, but also, I really like, and then like we can go into like our expectations for uh, the final episode, but I really like that Sam did not feel the need to explain why he didn't take the shield to Bucky or anyone else because yeah. he, it's shouldn't not, it, it, he shouldn't have to. It's not his job to explain the the drawback there so the fact Absolutely. that the show allowed bucky to come to those conclusions by himself realizing what happened what's happening to him with the police realizing what's going on with isaiah bradley that bucky had to come to that apology himself and that's how we can like pretty much heal is like people need to do the work and being anti-racist anti-prejudice just all of these things instead yeah. of having black people be the magical Oh yeah, so let me sit you down and teach you about these things because we shouldn't have to. You yeah. you should know that it's happening. Exactly. Bucky, Bucky's apology was such a great moment in the mm -hmm. last episode. I was like, this is yes, this is it right, right here. Yeah. Exactly. And it was such Our, a stark contrast to John Walker because literally, John Walker when when he's confronted with actual consequences to his actions, which his privilege have have shielded from him his entire life, his first instinct is to scream about how unfair it is which right. is just which insane. a black man would never have gotten away with in a uh -uh. Senate hearing by the way uh -uh. yes absolutely ever you thought and sam didn't complain when they gave yeah. it up. yeah i mean li literally he he's whining and throwing a fit because the one time in his life that he's he's not given the result that he wants and bucky mm -hmm. is a leading by example it's a great example for everyone who you know tries to be an ally that you this is your responsibility not only do you have to take responsibility for your own actions but it's your responsibility to even know what you did like learn what you've done right, wrong learn right. how to make it right don't expect people to explain things to you um and i, I think it it was a very very powerful and meaningful and I, i'm really glad i mean i didn't think that we would need to have these things spelled out to us so explicitly as the show has done but seeing the fan reaction we absolutely <laughs> let me, let me tell you man let me tell you it's it's so nice seeing like the the i told you so people oh i don't like when people oh. say i love a good i told you so i don't give a fuck um, <laughs> you you were wrong we were right nan nan boo boo um <laughs> so so going into uh episode six uh what 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 is one thing that we all hope to happen in the finale? What is something that we're looking forward to a, or a theory that you want to come true? Give us one or two of those things. Me, what I want is a one-on-one -on -one fight between busted as US agent John Walker and Sam is the new Captain America who literally put in the work with that tra awesome training montage, no, like bouncing the shield off of multiple things when John's only going one, two, one, two. Like I want to see the melanin beat the fuck out of this John Johnny Walker ass dude, and also Baltric is going to murder Carly. Nobody's going to get a chance to fight Carly. I think Baltric's going to murder Carly because he was sent by the power broker, and it's going to be one of those surprise like. Are we sure if Sharon is the power broker now? I'm pretty positive at this point. Like I, I haven't said it, but I'm pretty. I'm positive. always suspicious. I'm suspicious. I am suspicious of them. I. Yeah. It looks so. It looks. It looks. 
obvious, but I'm still like, mm, we'll see. <laughs> right, right. I'm, I'm going to be yeah. so mad if they make her into like a fucking henchman. I'm going to be so pissed. I just don't understand why they would set up a character to be so badass and powerful and then just be like, oh, no, 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 no. Actually, um, she she doesn't control shit. She's just, uh, she's there to, to be your misdirect to this. Hey, what's yeah. this over here? I hate the yeah. henchman that's like, that looks more competent than the actual person because she she sharon came in there and she was running shit her personality has completely changed which also could lend credence to the theory that she might be a scroll i don't know i'm not buying it just yet but it's possible but the fact that she came in whooping ass cat like headshotting people and just kind of like hey i'm in this fuck america type mindset and now i'm like in this shady underbelly of uh madripoor i Mm -hmm. like that and to have her even though her being revealed as the power broker will probably be the most, the easiest low hanging fruit thing to happen. I would still like that because that will put Sharon in a powerful position. And mm-hmm. also, I think that will also be offset it by the fact that Baltric was sent by her yeah. to murder Carly. Cause then that also unpeels another layer from Sharon as, Oh yeah, she helped Sam and them, but she's also a very dark character now. Like you know? I, it would be dope if Sharon was going to be on the, the Thunderbolts or whatever the Contessa is setting up, like literally like Dark Avengers, whatever. I, I mm-hmm. think that people, I've heard people say, oh, well, it'd be, it would be so uh, sad because Sharon wouldn't get to uphold her aunt's legacy of, of S.H.I.E.L.D. She, motherfucker, S.H.I.E.L.D. was infiltrated by Hydra. Like yep. that sucks. <laughs> like that yep. legacy is dead. Like, yep. That's yep. Yeah. And she I think that, we ain't yeah. shot a S.H.I.E.L.D. in you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I love like the the themes of these these characters who have been screwed over by the government. I love having like this commentary that you know, mm-hmm. I think in the comics for a long time, a lot of the stories comes from you know like older comics, and now I think it's a better it's a better commentary, a better story to be like, oh yeah, I mean the government royally fucked her despite the fact that she is, yeah, this she's Peggy Carter's niece and she doesn't get yeah. immunity. Remember, she murdered Cap. She was brainwashed, but she murdered Cap after the Civil War storyline in the comics. It was a dark period for Sharon Carter. So this could be not a one-to-one adaptation, but just taking her into that dark place. It could be very interesting for the for the future. I I was gonna say the same. Like betrayal is like whether it's your brainwashing or not, they can pull that element of like maybe she I mean I don't want it to be mind control or maybe she's mind controlled and maybe it's that sort of thing I do like Nikki I was in I was in that camp for the last like four episodes or five episodes I was just like it's too obvious it's right there it's really like, obvious who else could it be like she like they've not shown us like we're five episodes in like who else could it be I was like this is what Marvel always does and then it's gonna be revealed to being like Captain America I, the whole time I'm like <laughs> <laughs> and I don't like I said I don't know if this is misdirection or not but I did pick up a context clue because when they're in Madripoor and Sharon was hurrying them up, they're like, hurry up. She was like, hurry up, you're on borrowed time. And then the last text that Carly received from the power broker said, you are running on borrowed time, little girl. Oh, wow. And I was like, hmm, that's a Sharon fa- phrase. Mm, yeah. I mean, I think it would be really fitting for her character to be after the super soldier serum because she's seen all the damage that it has done in the hands of the U.S. government. And I think that that would be a really cool arc for her to be specifically after it because she doesn't want it to any any government. But she's especially seen the damage that the U.S. government has done. Like she she could know about Isaiah Bradley in in all probability. We Mm -hmm. don't know for sure. But yeah. And that's the thing they were like, it came from like part of it was the CIA. When as soon as they named her the CIA, I was like, okay, you want us to remember that she was CIA for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like you yeah. want us to do this. But again, like I was just kind of just like, not Marvel, you tricked me before. I've been Ralph Boner. I'm not doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. And I feel like I feel like us being Ralph Boner just kind of we need a little. I think we bonered. <laughs> we yeah, need a little. We have to turn that into a thing. <laughs> exactly. Totally We've been Boner. Ralph Bonard. Uh <laughs> the fact that we have been, I'm gonna say it as much as possible. The fact that we have been Ralph Bonard. <laughs> I think that we need a little obviousness now yeah. because the, it, the WandaVision was such a twisting path of misdirection and twist and which is appropriate because it's about magic show about magic but now it's like we need something a little bit more straightforward and maybe Marvel said hey let's just make her the power broker so I'm gonna give I'm gonna give one more stretch this is my last theory stretch ever since she is working in Madripoor and we all know that's a prominent X-Men location if she is the power broker, could she be like 
the catalyst for a mutant X gene similar to what they're doing in the ult- similar to what they did in the Ultimates universe. And since the MCU is almost most, mostly based off the Ultimate universe, that could be a way to kind of make Madripoor maybe a ground zero. And Sharon Carter is kind of at the center of it being the power broker because they're fucking with superhuman shit now. Yeah. You know, so that's that. just my, yeah. that's just kind of like my connecting yeah. dots that are probably not there. I mean, everything that happens in these shows, we have to assume it's setting up the next phase. And so everything is yeah, done absolutely. with attention. Exactly. Yeah. If, 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 if I have like, I mean, if we're gonna kind of go for like a, a somewhat stretch theory and like, I probably will make a video on this just because like, it, there's something there, but I'm just not connected all the dots yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like Nick Fury is gonna have some sort of link to Sharon Carter. I think yeah. he's, he's a, a missing thread uh, throughout this whole thing, primarily because of Batrock. Um, when when they're on the phone and you kind of you hear Patrick's voice uh, faintly of in the subtitles of just like speaking in French or whatever. Yeah, but, speaking um, French. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but, better like, than speaking Wakandan. Yeah. <laughs> not a real, <laughs> speaking not a real language. language. Yeah. She's speaking was... English first off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> speaking clear English. No, but I was very uh, fortunate to have a close friend who speaks fluent French and is from France, and I was like, hey. What did this guy just say? And apparently he was like, oh, um, she was like, oh yeah, busted you out of prison. And his response was, you're the one that put me in prison in the first place, or you're the one that got me into this in the first place. Which at first I thought, oh, she's the one that set up whatever he was doing in the first episode. Mm. But then I thought, well, the last person that technically hired Batroc was Nick Fury. He used Batroc to hijack the Lemurian star and Winter Soldier to kind of mm. slow down the whole helicarrier thing. So like Batroc's last real connection to any other character on the, in the whole MCU is Fury. And then kind of, this is where the, the stretch kind of comes in. If we're to assume she might be a scroll, that could be the connective thread that's like, ah, maybe ah. he sent Sharon down there to keep an eye on things. And she kind of like, he's just like, hey, there's this weird shit going on with Sam and Bucky. Can you just take care of it? Like kind of keep an eye on the flag smashes. I don't know. Mm. Well, and that's why I think she's been like when I I've, I've been saying it that I think she's got to be the power, power broker forever just because I I believe that Marvel does a lot of pretty straightforward storytelling and like I'm looking at it kind of more of like one of their you know it's a this it reminds me more of like the way that they would structurally tell a story in a film um, where you you know you set up the villain and it's it's not necessarily TV shows there is a little bit more because you want to keep people guessing the whole time. Um, mm-hmm. But I do think that, you know, it's been fairly straightforward, but I do think that that could be where the connection comes in, that she's she's connected to Fury or someone, mm-hmm. some other establishment that we don't yet expect. And her motivations are the real mystery of, you mm-hmm. know, because I think it's I think it's been pretty obvious. I mean, I think that it would be a, a pretty blatant and silly misdirect if she was irrelevant mostly yeah. mm-hmm. but you know like um I, I i am very interested to see what her motivations are and like because all these the things that we've talked about are really interesting directions that the mcu could go and she could be you know instrumental in that direction which is really right. really neat i'm, I'm curious yeah. about what what the motivations are Darren i Boner, think the skulls are a, a, a connected thread between the, the the first three and including back with i guess four like Mm -hmm. uh, pieces of phase four like we know the scroll thing kind of like the tail ended one division uh Mm -hmm. and in the in the loki trailer if you look if you squint and turn your head a little there's a scroll in the background in the Mm -hmm. tva it's like okay there's that's two which means it implies that this has got to have one too somewhere he's he's, he's gonna pop up (laughs) so and and considering they've got Contessa in this now yes. as well, yeah, I don't yeah. think I don't think they're gonna just be like Contessa's there and she's a scroll because I'm like, well, I didn't really know her, so I don't care. But right. because we know Sharon, maybe it's kind of doing like a little Una reverse. And it's like, no, she's regular, a regular person, and <laughs> Sharon is the gonna be the reveal scroll or something. Right. I don't that know, would be man. Very cool. They did kill Quicksilver after literally 15 <laughs> minutes of screen time and expected us <laughs> <Yeah>. to care. <laughs> like, Fucking Joss Whedon every oh, time. Gosh. Right. Gosh. And he, I, I liked him. <laughs> I, I really liked him. I actually liked him a lot better than yeah. uh, Evan Peters is Quicksilver, personality-wise uh, versus power set-wise. I thought he was closer to the comics Quicksilver because he was sarcastic. He didn't take shit. Uh, there's a great scene that lives in my mind that nobody appreciates is when the Avengers are fucking arguing, doing their regular bullshit, and he just unplugs the fucking oh, thing. And he's like, thing. He's like, like, hey, <laughs> I'm sorry. Keep going. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> yeah, I love him. I love him. Definitely watch the deleted scenes of Quicksilver as well, where it's uh, fucking Steve and Nat doing their fucking regular ass banter. 
and they like oh we're gonna like fuck they're like oh yeah we're gonna fuck shit up and here comes quicksilver he like speeds up and he has this arm of a fucking ultron robot and he goes like oh you guys done you guys done you ready now okay let's go he tosses cap the arm and he just like he zips off and i'm just like where the fuck was this guy anyway I'm, see no I'm, and th- I'm this is exactly why they should have killed clint in age of ultron instead they shouldn't have introduced him oh. yeah they should have yes. killed him instead of Quicksilver. We would have been able to keep Quicksilver because, yeah. and I, I need to say this on the podcast because I get this comment all the time. Marvel did not have to kill off Quicksilver because of Fox. No. That didn't, that's not Thank a thing. You. Thank you. Thank you. They also did not no. need to change their heritage. They couldn't use the word mutant and they couldn't reference any X-Men characters. Those were like the basics of the stipulations. I'm so tired of people being like, oh, well, they, they actually had to. Where did you hear that? They could Twitter, only use Reddit? Scarlet Witch. They could <laughs> only use Scarlet yeah. Witch and only one of them. Then why did they have them in there in the first place? Exactly. Just, yeah. just, that's not how the so contracts you, work. You could have just had her not have a sibling at all in the exactly. Exactly. Right. Really fine. It's, it's not it make more sense. Like it's the <laughs> yeah. same. It's the same. Twins. It's the same people that says in the Spider-Man movies the reason why they don't use Uncle Ben is because they the Sony wouldn't allow it. Why oh, would Sony no, not like, allow Uncle Ben? Like the most <laughs> iconic Spider-Man <laughs> character. I'm fucking sick and tired of seeing Ben die over and over, and they said, you know what? Let's fucking skip that part. <laughs> hey, we could skip it. That's fine. But you could do exactly what Spider-Verse did and just show one scene of him walking into the the yes. sunset and yeah. say the great power that comes great two seconds yeah. two Look, seconds a little photo a photo oh, of them on on a, on a desk being a like, photo oh, right yeah. Holy <laughs> crap. i'm sorry like oh justice for freaking yeah. uncle ben and i have yeah. a video planned today because apparently evie avi Irad, uh, arad who's like oh the, yeah uh, he's apparently it was right his now. fault yeah apparently it's his oh. fault he's like the like new a lot ike the- perlmutter Everybody right. Hated it's, him. it's apparently his fault that like a lot of the stuff that we love about Spider-Man, like he took out, which is why he made Spider-Man because he didn't trust Spider-Man as a kid to like survive on his own. So let's bring in Tony Stark. And apparently like War Machine was supposed to show up and all these other. And there was also supposed to be like like a scene in Far From Home where he's looking at graves and it's not just Tony's grave, but it's his parents and Uncle Ben. And so there's also like further teases that he took it out. So I'm I'm sorry. So I'm so passionate about. Apparently, he was also really mad really. about the Zendaya casting for MJ because he's a racist. Uh, racist. That's why they. That's why they made him. That's why they made her Michelle. Michelle. I, I like that in, in, in the final edit. They were just like Michelle, but she's MJ. Like they didn't make her a new character. She's <laughs> right. just MJ. She's his love interest. She's called MJ. There's nothing. But they're just like her name's Michelle because we didn't want to piss off every single white person that watches this. Right. So we'll just right. right. I mean, that could be a whole episode right there. Just like. Get, get Spider-Man together. I love Tom Holland and Spider-Man, but just like, there's just, there's just some things like Uncle Ben, you don't have to show his death, but there, he's the, he is the reason why he is Spider-Man in the first place. You yeah. need that. He's in every yeah. single universe, <laughs> every iteration, and he's the reason why. So, but yeah, but um, I think that just about does it for for our show for geeks of the week guys thank you so much for joining us on this podcast giving you guys giving your perspectives like let um... oh my god i gotta say like uh, juju and i were talking about like first first guest dream guest for the episode and like you guys were it like, like oh, especially oh, talking oh, about Falcon and the winter soldier we were like no like it's gotta be it's gotta be them it's gotta be them or nobody because like was, you guys it was a moment we looked at each other we were just kind of like looking at each other like you think what I'm thinking? She was like, oh, <laughs> yes, yes. And we just, we didn't even say your names out loud. We just kind of like, like we both that, hit the email that. at the same time. I and it was the same people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is this has been so much fun. I hope to have you guys on in the future if you guys want to come back. Absolutely. Anytime. This Anytime. Is fun. I, can, I can literally, we can go on for literally three hours about this type of oh, shit. Yeah. But we uh, have. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we did. But uh, yeah, so let us know where they can find you. Uh, T, where where can the people find you? Plug yourself. Uh, yeah, well, TikTok theories by T, as per usual. Um, I've just literally just uh, set up a YouTube channel where we're slowly, I'm going to slowly start feeding my content onto there as well. But also theories by T, pretty much everywhere else, except for Instagram, which is uh, Terrell Films, T-Y-R-E-L-L Films. Um, Seriously yeah. typing over- that. Please take over YouTube because there's so many toxic, uh, like geek okay. YouTube channels. I need yeah. you on there. Burn it to oh, yes. Clean it up. Take it by storm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Take one step at a time. Though I want to quickly <laughs> use this uh, uh, my quick section here to be like congratulations to both you guys on the podcast in general. Like I listened yeah. to the last episode oh, a couple thanks. days ago uh, while I was at the gym, and I was like, "Well, I'm not going to get any work done because I need to figure out what their top five DC movies are and why, and if I didn't agree or not." So I'm um, yeah, I'm loving it, and I'm excited to see you guys do more. Thanks a lot. We still don't know what we're doing. Thanks. Yeah, we're. <laughs> 
definitely a little bit um just figuring it out but hey you know what it's going well mm. good start <laughs> thank you thank you thank you so much guys appreciate it and nikki where can, where can the people find you where can they find oh, your yeah. hilariousness <laughs> everywhere um <laughs> At uh, Nikki Marina, N I C Q U E, and then Marina on every platform, and including YouTube. Um, I do. I put my skits on there, and I also do rants because they are because there are things that sixty seconds does not do justice, and I refuse to talk about them in the span of sixty seconds. And so <laughs> I do that on YouTube. But but yeah, that so yeah, you can find me everywhere at that handle. Your rants are fucking hilarious. I show oh I show God, your wife amazing. my rants all the time. Like <laughs> my wife loves your shit. She loves she loves a black woman who can rant like her. So I need to get y'all together and <laughs> y'all can hang out. <laughs> down, I'm down. I'm probably gonna knock one out after this. <laughs> <laughs> we got the material now. We we definitely got it. All right, and uh, once again, I am Straw Hat Goofy. You guys can find me at Straw Hat Goofy on TikTok, Straw Hat Movies on uh instagram because i have multiple instagrams and i don't know what to do with them um straw, straw hat movies as well on uh youtube which i don't post to but maybe i will start and also if you guys want to uh get some merch the straw hat goofy store is open we got goofy vibes only can i be your movie guy hoodies all that type of stuff so you can click any of the links in my bio and any one of my uh social media platforms and that is me i'm gonna sip some water now from my straw hat goofy mug oh yeah. it's me. Oh, his, his merch is so cute. It's ridiculous. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Jay Stoops. I'm all over the place. Um, you know, if you, if you type Jay Stoops, you're probably going to find me like Twitter is like the Jay Stoops, but also, um, be sure to follow us. We just got a Twitter for the podcast. We're Geeks yes. of the Week on Twitter. And that's where we're going to be posting, um, updates and like announcements about guests and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, follow us there. We are also going to be launching a Patreon. A lot of you have been messaging me. Mm-hmm. So information for that um should be on our uh podbean website and there'll be links in um in our bios as well but yeah so big stuff big exciting stuff is happening super super excited seriously i i said this when we made our announcement you don't know it but my heart is like in my stomach right now and (laughs) yes but definitely check out all these amazing people guys uh and thank you so much for listening to geeks of the week podcast we will see you next week with our continued coverage of marvel versus dc And just all things nerdy, geeky, comics, TV, movies, everything. So thank you so much for listening, guys. We will catch you later. Bye.